Welcome, everyone. My name is Liz Watkins. I'm Dean of the Graduate Division, and I will be your host for this morning's program. Chancellor Hoggard mentioned that this is our sixth annual All Alumni Reunion Weekend, and I'm delighted that this is our fifth time that we've done these very popular discovery talks. It's one of my great honors to be able to select five of my colleagues from the faculty to give talks, and I'm really excited for you to hear them, so I'm going to keep my introductory remarks brief. But before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work that's been done by the staff of alumni relations and events to put on this wonderful weekend for us. And in particular, I want to give a special thank you to Angie Dolphin for putting together these discovery talks. So please join me in a round of applause. Now, as you all well know, our faculty are engaged at the forefront of biomedical inquiry with research on that ranges from molecules and cells to individuals and populations. And what these discovery talks are intended to do is to give you a little bit of a taste of the exciting research that attracts our, our graduate students and postdocs to come to study at UCSF. They come to work with these talented faculty, um, and really the mentor-mentee relationship is mutually beneficial. The students and postdocs get to learn side by side with these world-class scientists and scholars, and in turn, these scientists and scholars get the benefit of a highly skilled team to help them carry out their research. It's no secret that graduate students and postdocs are the engines that drive the biomedical research enterprise at UCSF, contributing to the discovery and innovation that's the hallmark of our institution. Now, today the speakers are going to make their presentations with just a short introduction from me in between each talk. And I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end. What we'll do is we'll wrap up. The speakers have agreed to stay around, and they're happy to chat informally with whomever is interested. OK? So here we go. Our first speaker is Dr. Michael McManus. Michael is affiliated with no fewer than five PhD programs here at UCSF. Biomedical Sciences, which we call BMS, the TETRAD program, which is biochemistry, molecular biology, cell biology and genetics, biophysics, biomedical informatics, and pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacogenomics, which we call PSPG. His lab is located on the Parnassus campus, and it's known as the place where RNA biology meets human disease. More specifically, his group studies fundamental processes related to the regulation of gene expression. The title of his talk is Illuminating the Dark Matter of the Genome. Michael. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So. Um, I'll begin here with a little introduction, sort of a tutorial into molecular biology and genomics. These little letters that you see on the slide comprise part of the message of this sort of amazing constellation of little chemicals um, that make up DNA. And inside each of our cell, in the nucleus of each of our cell, lies our genome. And our genome is composed of the letters A, C, T, and G. These little molecules are basically strung together like pearls on a necklace. And there's a lot of it. There's 3.3 billion base pairs of information. This is what we call them, base pairs. And in fact, there's so much of it crammed into each cell that if you were to take it out of each cell, the DNA, and stretch it like a string, it would actually be taller than me. And if you were to take all the DNA of all your cells and stretch them end to end, it would reach all the way to the sun and back 300 times. <laughs> now, that's a lot, right? <laughs> that would be about 100 days if you were going in light speed in your spaceship. So there's a lot of sort of highfalutin you know, analogies and metaphors to explain this amazing thing we call DNA in the genome but inside the genome really is the secrets to life. It really is what makes us human. And around the late 1980s, the NIH um, and a private industry decided to embark on a major expedition, which is to sequence the genome the in, in its full entirety of the human being. And they proposed a 15-year project, would cost $200 million a year, um, 
and it would be of a magnitude akin to sending the man to the moon. That's a lot of DNA to sequence. It wasn't easy. But we did it. Um, and around 2000, um, we published the first draft. But it wasn't an easy endeavor. There were a lot of people that were uh, antagonists. They had suggested that maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe the effort wasn't going to be worth it. $200 million is a lot to spend on any major project. And, um, and they argued maybe that funds would be better spent in smaller, more meritorious research grants for individual labs studying a, a perhaps worthier science. And some argued that maybe we shouldn't even, even go down this road. Um, because if it was successful, we might lurk into areas where no human being should go um, and learn things that we probably shouldn't really learn and uncover mysteries that weren't really meant to be uncovered, like the sexual history of your partner or the ingredients of a sausage. <laughs> Some things you just don't need to know. But the proponents argued that this was a key uh, to understanding life and human and undercovering, you know, basically understanding human disease. They argued that unlike a project like sending a man to the moon, this was a project that you could revisit back and forth many times. In fact, they argued that maybe in this century, in this century and the next century, this is something that every student and doctor would do, uh, perhaps on a daily basis to go back and visit the human genome sequence. It would provide a fundamental reference. But we did it. And that was incredible feat. And it has affected my science. It has affected the biologists um, at UCSF and the community around the world. Now, the question is, what did we learn? So uh, I, would, I would argue the first thing that we learned is that half of your genome is actually composed of these things called, they're like repetitive elements. Um, in fact, they're almost like sort of vestiges or evolutionarily ancient fossils of viruses. So the half of the genome, we just, it, it doesn't really make sense what it is, but it's, it's a little bit of history. The second thing we learned is that we have about 20,000 genes in the human genome. And that's a lot less than the 50,000 to the 100,000 that, that, that many scientists thought we um, had. And the shocking thing about that was that I mean, worms and flies contain about 20,000 genes. And they're worms and flies. <laughs> and this magnificent thing called humans, you know, we just thought that there should be something more. <laughs> but there's not. And um, I mean, half the genes in your genome are in a banana, basically. Um, and we are much more similar to worms and flies than, than, than you would imagine. And, um, and that was a pretty um, um, impactful thing for a lot of science, scientists to appreciate. You know, the third thing that we learned is that the building blocks of life, which are proteins, when you look at a human body, you largely see a lot of uh, um, structures that are made of proteins. Proteins are the things like, like collagen that, you know, make up, you know, your skin. Um, keratin that make up your hair and fingernails. You know, these are the building blocks of life, but yet only 2.5% of your genome encodes for proteins. The other 90% you know, 90 or so encode for, well, we don't know, dark matter. And it's this dark matter which my lab studies, and it's just fascinating. Um, and the dark matter, at one time, people thought it was junk DNA. That's what they called it, junk DNA. <laughs> um, but we now know that it's, it's not just junk. I mean, it, it's true. Maybe a lot of it is junk. But, but we're constantly finding new things. And one of the really cool molecules that we found are these tiny classes of the sm world's smallest genes called microRNAs. And microRNAs are really neat because they regulate the expression of all the other genes. They partner with them. They connect with them. And they restrict them from being expressed in all cells of your body. With 20,000 genes, it would do no good if all genes were expressed at full volume in all cells of your body. That would be a veritable cacophony. It would be like going to a concert with 20,000 instruments, all of them playing at once. But microRNAs tell 
which tell different genes which ones should be expressed. So a heart cell should express only the heart genes, and a brain cell should only spell, express brain genes, and microRNAs are responsible for that. And microRNAs aren't the only molecules within the dark genome. In fact, there are many others, I, more than what I have time to go into. I would say that, um, that that part of the genome, I think, is one of the most interesting parts of the genome. It's, um, the genome is really a parts list, if you will. It's a blueprint. The genome contains thousands and thousands of parts. A, a car contains about 30,000 parts, if you count all, every little down to the last screw and gear. And I think if I gave most of you guys a parts list for the car, you probably wouldn't know how to put it together. Sure, some of you might know that the steering wheel, you know, where that goes and the, you know, the, the, where the wheels go, but would you know the steering wheel can, you know, connects to a steering shaft, and that connects to a pinion, a type of gear that helps to control the steering of the car? Most of us probably wouldn't know, and that's, what, um, that's the way most scientists think about DNA. We just don't know about all those little things, and that's what we're excited to, to figure out. And um, it's, um, it's just incredible wonder. It's, it's a wonderful time to be a scientist, to figure out the things that make us human, the things that make us a family. Thank you. <laughs>